Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Zola Rose about regenerative development, permaculture, and eco-village design. Zola Rose, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you. Well, great for having me. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from New Zealand. I am south of Salt Lake City in Utah. So there's a wee bit of a time difference. Afternoon for me, morning for you. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to chat with you and to share your perspective around regenerative development, permaculture, and eco-village design from a social impact lens. We're going to be connecting this back to general wellness approaches within and connecting with organizations and what we can do as leaders in promoting that within our organizations. As we get started, I wanted to share Zola's bio with everybody. Zola Rose is currently working in the alternative housing and intentional community sector, offering consulting training, facilitation, and network weaving services to engage regenerative housing communities through her social enterprise, Common Ground, based on the principles of regenerative development, permaculture, and eco-village design. Uh, Zola, anything else you would like to share with me or my listeners by way of your background uh, before we dive right on in? I just have a very diverse background that hopefully in the questions will bring that all in, weaving it together. I think um, it's really great to have a vocation uh, that I am able to draw upon my experiences and my skills uh, that have been so varied. And now I'm finding able to give back um, with all those experiences. And that's what we'll be sharing a little bit about today. Yeah, awesome. And and to lay a foundation for that weaving together of this narrative, uh, maybe you can share a little bit more about um, your meandering kind of diverse background and path. Uh, we, I think we all tend to have that, right? We, very few people know exactly what they're going to be doing and then go on a linear path perfectly throughout their lives. And, uh, and that brings with it a lot of diversity of experience and exposure to lots of different things, ideas, people, all of those sorts of things. Uh, share a little bit about that with us, about your own background, and then we can talk more specifically about your current uh, role in common ground and what you're doing in the social impact uh, social enterprise space. Okay, great. Um, well, I grew up as an expatriate, uh, um, as a dependent of my mother who was in the foreign service. And so I had a diversity of um, people that I was growing up with in the home country that I was living. Um, I l- grew up in Russia, in Jordan, in the Congo, in Bangladesh, Thailand, Madagascar, so many different countries. And I really loved uh, the cultural uh, richness um, in which I was growing up. And that led me to study sociology and anthropology, trying to make sense and trying to figure out what could I do with this love of cultures. And while I was in school, I learned about mediation. And so this interaction between people and how can people have win-win solutions. And that has a lot to do with culture because if we can understand where each other is coming from, our, our, our worldview, then it's easier to find a win-win. And so there was already one linkage between having such a variety of cultural understanding and also being in that space of helping people to um, unpack their culture to be able to get to win-win 
uh, whether that be in resolving a conflict or in working towards a common vision. And um, studied uh, permaculture, which is a systems design thinking that is around the ethics of earth care, people care and fair share, which is around the economics. And again, got really to that interweaving that we don't separate people from our environment or from even the systems um, that in which we operate. Each one influences the other. And um, I studied eco-village design and how we develop our settlements, how we live to be inclusive of all those um, different aspects, again, of the um, dimensions of life, not focusing on one specifically, but on interweaving all of them in how we do our, our design going into our, um, our living spaces. And um, also studied nonviolent communication. That's always interesting to me how we communicate with each other in order to be able to be understood and understand another and even understand ourselves. And so that's been another weaving in of the work that I do because we can't advance um, goals of being able to do things better if we're either in our own way or if uh, there's a lot of conflict that we're having with the others around us, the vision is not going to happen. So that's what I do in terms of a rege regenerative lens. When we bring people together and we have an engaged team, what makes for an engaged team to be able to accomplish its mission, whether it be in a community where people are living or in a business where people are working, it's being able to have those right relationships and seeing ourselves as whole human beings, as the cultures that we come from. And from that grounding, then we can move forward for better outcomes. So much there. That, that, that was really great. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I love the background. Uh, I'm a sociologist uh, myself, and I, I don't know if you can see my shirt, uh, but but I, I do work with our Center for Social Impact uh, here at the university, and I'm a, a big believer in that. And um, you, you, you mentioned systems approaches and, and things like that. All of that is so important as we try to uh, figure out how to make a, a meaningful, sustainable difference in the world. Uh, and the, the cool thing is this isn't just something for do-gooders, you know, to do on their own, but this is something that organizations really can focus in on and to have, you know, you, you run your social enterprise common ground. Every organization can have a component of their purpose you know, and mission to be a social mission. Every organization uh, can tap into those motivations of their people mm -hmm. and give them opportunities, uh, provide an environment where they can make those contributions and and, and uh, mm -hmm. feel that impact and see that impact in the world mm -hmm. around them. And so there's just so much there, whether we're talking about social impact, social enterprise, social entrepreneurship, or corporate social, so, corporate social responsibility, triple bottom line, stakeholder capitalism, whatever we're talking about, all of that comes back to different framings around what we can do uh, to, to leverage our, uh, you know, our, our influence within our sphere to make a difference in the world around us. And, and I, th I think that's fantastic. You talked about regenerative development and some of the principles behind that. Um, from, from just the housing perspective, and we're not going to dwell on that too long, but regenerative development, permaculture and eco village design, community housing, those sorts of things. Tell us a little bit more about that, uh, just because I think it's just so fascinating in what you're trying to do. So I've got a, a diagram that helps me to uh, explain to others around what I consider to be a regenerative form of development. And it includes um, the regenerative framework, which is those dimensions of the economic, uh, social, cultural and ecological and how those are taken into consideration when we're designing a living uh, system. And then I mentioned around the personal and collective leadership that we all need to recognize our own, whether it be shortcomings or um, where we might be triggered and uh, understanding group dynamics, facilitation, and uh, the collective uh, energy that we can create together. And then we've got the built environment and all those elements of the built environment when we are designing, keeping those other two in mind um, and 
playing with those other elements when we're working with the built environment, when we're designing, whether it be the roads or the power or the waste or the water, even the legal and financial. And quite often there becomes that, I mean, there's points of resistance at any one of those um, dimensions. But I find that for me working in this space now, there's a lot of advocacy that's needed because when we start to get into the built environment where there's a lot of regulations around how we do our building um, infrastructure, uh, whether it be urban or rural, there's a lot of restrictions based on the worst case, you know, trying to restrict the the people uh, doing bad. And we then have restrictions on the innovation where we want to show this um, new way that we can build. Actually, we're working on kind of a in more indigenous way of building if we look at the indigenous societies um, and how they structured their living environments. That's actually kind of what we're working towards. But we've become very um, pigeonholed in the way that we think, oh, this can only be housing and every house needs a car in front. So we ha- all have to have a garage there. And so we get very... Um, mechanical way of thinking and um, we've separated everything out versus understanding what are we really looking what are the values that we want this place to have and then how do we build out of a value system a principle based what I call um, having the function um, being the driver of the form. And at this point in time, we've got the form, which is, you know, how are the roads going to be and the houses going to be uh, driving then the function. And then we end up with a dysfunctional um, society because people are living in spaces that are actually mechanistic in their um, in, the, in the way that they're set up. And we are not mechanistic creatures. We're, you know, natural, <laughs> um, you know, human creatures. And so there's this disconnect between our natural way of being in a more mechanical kind of a uh, living and, and also the way we commute to work. And there's a lot of separation between home and work because we have, you know, suburban ways of developing that are separated from commercial centers and, and so on. So when we start to look at uh, the function and the principle-based way of um, wanting to have outcomes with with our um, housing, we then have a lot of education to do of the officials, the planners, the council folks, and maybe municipality uh, who actually need to have this education around the principles of regenerative design thinking in order that they can help us to rewrite zoning or codes that uh, accommodate and facilitate the kinds of um, housing living spaces that we that we actually need to bring more peace, uh, more harmony. Um, even if we look at how in Nelson, where I'm living, for instance, we've just had terrible landslides and flooding. And of course, my first thinking goes to, well, it's because of the way that we've designed with profit and an ease of developers being able to develop rather than thinking about how do we work with natural systems. And if we look at how nature operates, we'd actually develop differently to accommodate um, things like heavy rain and um, yeah, the other, the other natural factors that ends up, yeah. end up disrupting in the end <laughs> our living spaces. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I really find that, that uh, concept you just referred to, I'd love for you to, to uh, hash it out a little bit more for us and explain a little bit more regenerative design thinking. Um, I, I love design thinking. I I'm very familiar with the concept of design thinking or equity centered design thinking. Tell us a little bit more about regenerative design thinking. Wow, there's a lot of uh, ways to think about it. One of the um, models that I uh, think about is the nested systems that we are nested within, whether it be an organization or a neighborhood, which is nested within, uh, could be a watershed area. That's an ecological system, which is nested in a country or a county. Um, And so we look at are what what are we wanting to create in terms of sustainable evolutionary change in the wider system 
And then we look at, well, what are the capabilities and the ways of thinking that we need to have at any one of those other systems in which we are nested? So going back to ourself, um, where do we have our, our way of thinking and our locus of control and um, being able to work with others and being able to think and hold all these complexities? And then how do we then work with the systems that are around us in the neighborhood, the um, the culture that is there already. It could be that we're looking at where things need to be rebalanced or brought into harmony in our in our local area. And then that then impacts on the wider system. I think really thinking locally, it's that kind of going back to that phrase of thinking globally and acting acting locally. And we need to think what is in our wider system, but that we can actually work with um, the elements in our more you know, proximity, our closer proximity, um, so that we're working with not something that we want to achieve that's outside of what already exists, but looking, I like to think about guilds, guilds being that there's um, relationships between the different entities that exist already, and how do we strengthen those relationships? Um, we develop more reciprocity in our thinking rather than a transactional way of thinking of, oh, if I give to you, what am I getting in return? Um, but a reciprocity means that I might give to you, but I might get from somewhere else and building on systems of reciprocity. Yeah, so those are some of the, the terms of the ways of thinking about um, regenerative um, systems, yeah. it's really, it, it's really almost taking the way that we do things now and almost um, turning it on its head in some ways uh, yeah. uh, so that we're able, a, able to rebuild in a different way. Yeah. Super interesting. And this is an, a bit of a bit of an aside, but I was just yesterday having a conversation with my daughter, my oldest daughter, who, who is a university freshman um, architecture major and she was lamenting as we were driving around all of the the uh, subdivisions and, and the canned neighborhoods, and just <laughs> it it just it just makes her skin crawl. And mm-hmm. and uh, we're we're having basically this kind of a conversation just yesterday uh, about how we can be more thoughtful about how we put together our communities. And you know, I challenged her to come up with the great, the best, you know, the the next new innovation in in uh, communities and housing <laughs> to to allow for, sus- because- for sustainable housing um you know f- in a way that will better fit with the the surrounding ecosystem in the community so well i'm doing the same thing with my daughter she's second year at university studying law and and just like you i'm also asking her these questions is how can you use what you're studying and learning to be able to influence. And of course, my area is housing. And I'm yeah. thinking, well, legally, you know, we need to rewrite our zoning laws and our, right. and our regulations. Wouldn't you like to um, look at your legal studies <laughs> in such a way and don't only follow what is, but what could be, you know, question actually our legal systems that are in place so that you're a- able to use your, your law way of thinking to help to redesign. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's yeah. great. Let's take the the rest of our time now and talk about how this connects back to organizations. You've talked about um, some principles in, in relation to organizations and culture, as well as uh, this idea of holistic employee wellness that I think connects mm-hmm. back to all of these ideas. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your work with Common Ground and how you go about, you, you do consulting work, training and facilitation with organizations and leaders. Tell us about some of that and, and what organizations can do as they're trying to better promote holistic wellness within their teams. With housing, my particular focus on housing is community-led development. And so what does that mean when folks were looking to them to lead their own development? So in housing, it would be what capacity do people need to have to be able to think about how they want to live and have the skills uh, and connections and agency to be able to do that? And what are the ways that we can build people up to feel like they're really coping? co-designers, co-creators, that they are uh, they have agency and are seen as equal p- 
partners rather than as just recipients, beneficiaries. And um, in some cases, even if we look at uh, housing, we look at the lower um, socioeconomic, we almost see them as victims. Um, and, and what can we give to them uh, rather than as active role players having also skills and strengths uh, that they can bring to their own way of um, housing themselves. And so that's what I do within housing. I look at the capability that needs to be built with both the folks that are going to live there in the future, but also the community that's around, you know, what capability uh, does the surrounding community have to lend? And what is the capability of the folks who are, again, like council or municipality leaders, what capability do they need to have in order to um, know more to do better? And so that engaged Um, interaction is not like we're here to help you, but we're here to work together on a common mission. Because as you get yourself, as as, as you are housed in a a wonderful way, so us as a council or as a community, we're able to operate at a higher, at a higher standard, because we've all raised our agency in this, um, in this place. And I think for organizations, it's the same, seeing everyone in the organization as um, a whole human being, what do they contribute? And it's really around the processes that we, the culture, the culture and process goes together that we embed in an organization that allows for there to be feedback so that feedback can be received in a way that is uh, nourishing and that is um, I guess up, uplifting and not degenerating or putting people again into, uh, something's wrong here. It needs to be fixed, but feedback in such a way that it adds, it adds value. So those are the things that I work with in the housing space that are equally applicable, I think, within an organizational space. Uh, one of the tools that I use um, is nonviolent communication. It's a process that looks at the feelings and needs of people and that a lot of action that we have or all of our actions come out of trying to meet a need. It could be a need um, that even we're not aware of it sometimes needs a bit of uncovering. Oh, why did you act this way? Um, why did you react in such a um you know, either an aggressive or forceful way. Ah, uh, it's there's a need that either hasn't been met over a period of time, or it's maybe even a need from childhood that's sort of resurfacing. That that can happen when, um, when we don't take the time to actually ask those questions. And so, yeah, I think in an organization, slowing down to look at what's the culture that we have here in this organization. Uh, what are the processes that we have that builds a healthy culture? And how, if we slow down enough to do that, it actually speeds up the other parts of the work that we want to do, because the best of everybody is then brought to the forefront. And there's a vulnerability um, that's able to be held in a safe way, that when people have something come up for them that is triggering or is a need, they're able to actually express that people can see them hear that and they're able to you know have that language of interpreting what's going on here because we don't really have that language of being able to interpret what's really going on here and so part of it is an unlearning of some of the unhelpful ways we have of speaking and thinking about each other and ourselves and and then relearning some new language and and then embedding that within the culture of the organization Super interesting, Zola. This has just been a fascinating conversation. I know at the time, uh, I have to let you go here in just a few minutes, but the truth is we've only just scratched the surface. There's so much more (laughs) to be said on any number of of these topics, Um, but we're going to have to leave it there for today. Uh, Before we wrap up, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your work with Common Ground, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Okay. Well, Common Ground, the website is commonground.net.nz. And we've got a YouTube channel where I've been making videos and interviewing people who are doing some pretty awesome stuff in this space of regenerative living and housing. 
I have a newsletter that I send out with both um, these kinds of topics that I explore, but also a little bit about my own story that's embedded within this, like how I'm learning through the process of doing this work. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as well, where I share there about my work. I have a Women Revolutionizing Housing, which is not limited just to this country um, of Aotearoa, New Zealand, but it's for any woman that feels like she wants to be a part of systems change um, in, in any form of housing. And we meet monthly online, bringing on speakers and networking with each other. I've got a housing in service to life consortium. Again, it's not limited to this country, but it's folks who align with that regenerative way of doing um, development and who want to connect with other professionals, how we can learn from each other, help each other um, in, in open new areas. Um, that's that's some of, <laughs> of ways that, that people can connect with me. Um, just in terms of if housing is something that's interesting to anybody that's uh, listening, and in America, there is a regenerative real estate group that has formed in America uh, that I'm looking to actually connect with and, and bring over here to this country. Um, and there is Regenesis, which is um, a, it's the organization that I trained in to do regenerative um, practitioner. You know, it's this thinking, design thinking. So that's available to people in America. Um, and there's the Global Eco Village Network. If people really love the idea of looking in the permaculture and a uh, really holistic way of, um, again, living. Uh, the Global Eco Village Network, they have uh, things going on in America. And if people are looking for community, like a, an intentional community to live in, there's the Foundation for Intentional Community, IC.org, where people can find communities that are actually forming or are established where this way of being um, is trying to be um, embedded within a place, a living place. But quite often there's organizations working within those communities doing this work as well. So, yeah, I look forward Wonderful. to people connecting with me, coming onto the website, sharing with me. I love to interview people, too. So if somebody's got a great story, um, you know, come onto the Common Ground YouTube channel. And that's what I would I would leave folks with. It's just a, a feeling that there actually is an abundance of wonderful things going on, of little sprouts all over the place that are happening. Um, like if you were to forage for the wild plants, you don't notice until you understand, oh, a dandelion, uh, I can do this with it. And there's a plantain, then you start to see that all of a sudden, wow, there's all these great um, edible wild plants. When I walk around my yard, I didn't even realize it was there. The same thing, I think, with regenerative practice and with um, these ways of communicating. When we open up our awareness to the fact that it's there, we can then find other people that are doing it in our local communities, connect with them and bring it home. Wonderful. Thank you, Zola. This has just been a great conversation. I encourage my audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Zola and her team at Common Ground could do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. You enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Discover the unparalleled beauty of Kanab, Utah, the heart of the parks, and the ultimate base camp for your national park adventures. Kanab, Utah offers easy access to not one, not two, but three of America's most iconic national parks. Explore the majestic Grand Canyon, hike the stunning trails of Zion, and witness the awe-inspiring landscapes of Bryce Canyon. All just a stone's throw away from Kanab. But Kanab is more than just a gateway. Locals call it the Little Hollywood. It's a charming town with a vibrant community. So whether you're an outdoor enthusiast, a nature lover, 
or a curious traveler, Kanab welcomes you to make unforgettable memories in the heart of the parks. Plan your journey to Kanab today at visitkanabutah.com. Your gateway to endless adventures starts here. Ew, gotta get rid of this old Backstreet Boys t-shirt. Tell me why. Because it stinks, boys. Tell me why. I've washed it so many times, but the odor won't come out. Tell me why. No, you tell me why I can't get rid of this odor. Have you tried Downy Rinse and Refresh? It doesn't just cover up odors. It helps remove them. Wow, it worked, guys. Yeah. Downy Rinse and Refresh removes more odor in one wash than the leading value detergent in three washes. Find it wherever you buy laundry products.